So, Jer, introduce our guest properly. I can't do it. I'm, I'm crazy. <laughs> well, I think the best way to introduce him would be have um, Dave introduce himself and some of the work which he has done uh, to our listeners. Why don't you introduce yourself, Dave, and uh, we'll go from there. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm Dave Wolverton. I also write under the name of David Parland in fantasy. Um, I did a number of Star Wars projects. I did Courtship of Princess Leia. Uh, I did uh, uh, some young adult things and some middle grade books and and uh, actually did about 17 different projects with Lucasfilm all together. So uh, it's had a lot of fun. I was a big Star Wars geek when I was young, wanted to grow up to be a Jedi, you know, uh, <laughs> and all that good stuff. And, uh, you know, when the first movie came out, um, I was, uh, I think I was 18 at the time, and I went and saw it and just loved it. And uh, back then, we didn't have things like, uh, you know, DVDs or videotape players or anything. So I went and saw the movie about 30 times, um, a little over 30 times in about six months, so that I could memorize it. The first six times, I just loved it. And after that, I started studying it, trying to figure out why I loved it. Um, and I think that that probably had a lot to do with me becoming a writer eventually, you know. And so it was a lot of fun when... Uh, when uh, Bantam Books, you know, called up and said, hey, would you like to do a Star Wars novel? And I said, absolutely, and uh, and just had a blast with it. Wow, that's, that's really actually kind of cool. You know what? If I may, first question, if you've seen it 30 times, and, you know, after the first six, just because this is awesome, what, while watching it, you know, over the course of the many times that you did, what conclusions did you draw as to why you loved it so much? You know, I think that um, there were a number of, of powerful things in there. You know, there, there was a sense of beauty and grandeur to the, to the, uh, to the movies. Um, you know, the, the opening scene, that one scene where Luke Skywalker is staring off at the, the uh, double suns going down, you know, there on Tatooine and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I just remember looking at that and thinking, you know, that's really cool. That's so beautiful. And it doesn't really accomplish anything from the point of view of story. Um, and there were just a lot of moments like that, that uh, just one after another that blew your mind. You know, it wasn't until years later that I went to uh, Lucasfilm and, um, you know, learned about, you know, gosh, that was also the introduction of Dolby Stereo. Uh, and, you know, we had that moment where you have the big spaceships flying overhead and the seats are just rumbling and everything. Nothing like that had ever happened before in a movie. And so there were there were groundbreaking things in there that, um, you know, even even trying to study it from the point of view of story. Um, I just, you know, I, I, I didn't even get that. I was like, oh, of course, you know, that was part of the experience. And that was really what it was. It was a movie that you had to experience back then um, because it really was groundbreaking in, in so many different ways. And, you know, the audience, know it. they were just beat off on this journey. Okay, so, uh, you know, you, you grew up a, a fan, and then when uh, when Bantam called you to to write a book, what was your, your, your first idea? Like, how much of Courtship of Princess Leia is yours, and how much of it was theirs? And uh, what was the process of coming up with a story for that book and then getting it approved and so on? Because I know Lucasfilm tends to vet their writers pretty well. Yeah, they're pretty... Mm. Well, you know, I had uh, I was already an award-winning writer at the time, and so um, my agent, or excuse me, my, my editor called me and said, "Would you be interested in doing a Star or, or what, no?" She said, "What do you think about Star Wars?" And I started talking to her about the archetypal storyline and why I liked it, and she says, "No, no. What I mean is, would you be willing to write a Star Wars novel?" Um, and uh, that was kind of my introduction to it. And I said, um, yeah, I'd like to. Let me finish up the one I'm working on. And then she called up a couple of weeks later and said, okay, do you want to do a Star Wars novel? And I said, yeah. Uh, so it was, pretty, <laughs> it was pretty easy. From there, um, what, what they did was they said, she said, okay, write up a proposal and uh, get it to me in three days. And so um, I'd been thinking about it in the back of my mind and, uh, you know, my wife and I, uh, I think at that time, had just watched um, 
you know, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, uh, which is about some gentlemen who kidnap a, women and uh, take them up to their mountain cabin and they all fall in love. And uh, I thought, you know, it'd be kind of fun to do something a little bit like that. I just didn't think that Leia and Han could get married that easily. So, um, so I wanted to come up with a reason why Han would kidnap Leia and take her somewhere. And, uh, and I don't know how it all came together that, uh, you know, the idea was that he wins a planet in the card game. Uh, but uh, I came up with the idea that Han Solo would do that. And then I went and talked to my writing group, got a bunch of friends who were Star Wars fans, and we just kind of sat down and came up with the, uh, with the storyline in uh, oh, probably about a day and a half. And I wrote the outline, sent it off to Lucasfilm, um, or sent it off to my editor, who then sends it to Lucasfilm. Um, and at that time, uh, you know, George Lucas was actually going through and he read the outline mm -hmm. and uh, made a couple of notes and basically said, this sounds really cool. And, uh, and um, you know, we were able to go ahead and, and move through the process. Um, once Lucasfilm approves it, then you write the story, and I did. I made a couple of little minor changes, which I think, um, to the outline, which I think improved the book. Um, then we sent it back to Lucasfilm again and uh, had their team go through the story uh, sort of line by line. They had a couple of queries uh, for George Lucas, and he went through and answered all the queries. and. Um, and he ended up um, really being very nice about the whole thing. I don't think I had any major changes. You know, the little kinds of things that I had were just like minor one-line edits, you know, take out this line or that line or something like that. Um, so it was really, really easy to work with Lucasfilm. That was that was really the big bonus. I, and I've worked on a couple of other movies and um, uh other projects, you know, with gaming companies and things like that. And Lucasfilm was just so easy to work with and, and gave you a lot of freedom at that time. And so, so that was really good. So just to backtrack just a little bit, if this, if Courts of a Princess Leia were a movie, Han Solo would have to be going down the streets of Coruscant singing Bless My Beautiful Hide. That's right. He would. <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. I I may have seen that movie a few dozen times. Oh, my God. You see what I have to deal with? I say this every episode, but it is true. This is what I have to put up with. That's right. It's classy. It's a good musical. You should watch it, too. I know that. I'm just... <laughs> anyway, besides the point, moving along. But, okay, on, on the topic, you know, of Star Wars projects, they said about 17 projects, if I'm correct? Yeah, yeah. A did, out of those... Well, that's what I was going to say. Out of all those projects, you know, with, you know, the whole The Courtship for Princess Leia, you know, kind of aside, because that's the first one. Yeah. But other than that, which one would you say that you felt that you had the most connection to? Like, that you felt was really one of your, like, uh, shall we say, favorite things to have done? Yeah. Well, you know, what I did was I, I did some short stories, um, and, and those were fun. Uh, but you know, I, I, I got to tell you about an experience. I, I did um, I did the Rising Force, which was a young adult novel, and then I was asked to write some little uh, gaming books for Scholastic, uh, where it was called the Star Wars Adventures Fan Club, I think it was. Um, and this is little middle grade books. And what you did was you wrote a story, and then at certain points, the kids get to roll dice and find out what happens next, and and so things can change. Um, and you have various endings and middles and stuff like that. And and that was kind of fun. But the first one of those that I did was kind of uh, – was – was it came out really well. And um, and the head of Scholastic really loved it and said, you know, this is the best thing that, uh, that we've published in the 40 years that, that I've been here. And uh, she was so impressed with it that uh, she actually – called me up and asked if I would be willing to, um, you know, look at some of their books and help them decide which book to put big for the next, uh, for the next few months. And so they sent me a whole bunch of books from Scholastic and, um, I picked out my favorite book and said, okay, um, I think you should push this book called Harry Potter. And, uh, okay. so, uh, and she said, oh no, the marketing department doesn't like that one. 
And I said, why? And she said, well, it's too long. And I said, yeah, and it's written three grade levels too high. But I went on to explain why I thought it would be a big hit. Um, and so, you know, it was kind of funny how all of this led to other things, you know. Um, but uh, but I really loved writing. One of the books that I really loved the best was a little series of three books called The, the Ghostling Children that I did. Um, which were just little Star Wars adventures, but in those ones, they went ahead and let me do it without the gaming aspect so that they were just stories. And uh, so a little, little set of middle grade books I thought were just a blast to write and um, really enjoyed doing that. Okay, so uh, you've been able to create, you know, a lot of books in the Star Wars universe, and you've been able to create a lot of Star Wars, you know, characters that have progressed on through now how many well, who knows how many books there's been now? Too I lost count. Too around. many. I lost count years Two ago. Two million, yes. Yes, exactly. So, uh, 13,872. I don't know how well you've, you know, followed the books, but have have you been, like, following your characters through? And if so, like, how, how do you like what other authors have been able to do with some of the characters that, you know, you created? And, you know, when you read a book going, ah, I created this character. This is cool. Have you been able to follow any of your characters through Star Wars um, well, you know, chronology? Kevin Anderson did some, took some of my characters and put them in, um, uh, you know, the Young Jedi Knight series. And, of course, uh, uh, things have been on video games. You know, the, they've taken some of the planets, Dathomir, and, and uh, put them into video games and stuff. And so that was kind of fun. I think one of the funnest things that happened was my wife sent me a um, – or not my wife. My daughter sent me a Christmas card last year. And it has a picture of Yoda um, uh, on the front of it. And he's sitting there with his coffee mug in his lounging chair uh, reading a book. And uh, it says something like, um, you know, uh, borrow the car, you cannot, or something like that. I don't remember. There's a nice little joke thing. But the funny thing was he had this mug there, and I was like, wait a minute. I recognize that picture on the mug. That's one of my Dathomir fighter pilot, uh, fighter pilot, fighter ships. And, uh, you know, it's just a very simple. Anybody who saw it wouldn't recognize what it was except for me. And the only way that I recognized it was it was a sketch that I'd sent off to, um, I think it was West End Games years ago, when they asked me, what do the spaceships look like for the various, uh, for the various classes of ships for Dathomir? And uh, so anyway, it was just kind of funny how this kind of, th these kinds of things come back to haunt you, you know, in ways that you'd never, I never would have expected. Oh, you know, absolutely. I, 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 I've noticed through... Speaking to many various, you know, authors of Star Wars, uh, you know, novels and stories and games and what have you, that it, it tends to do that a lot where, you know, a lot of them will go, you know, hey, I saw this and it just kind of blew my mind because, you know, I made that. Yeah. And on, th on that sort of a grain of, of, you know, things that have been created, for listeners that aren't completely familiar with you, um, would it be possible to get a sort of, um, shall we say, uh, a list, if you will, of things that you have created in the Star Wars universe for those that aren't aware? Oh, gosh. You know, uh, that's that's a little um, – uh, you know, in Courtship of Princess Leia, I did um, – uh, of course, created the uh, Dathomir um, and uh, the Witches of Dathomir and uh, uh, some of that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, I think there was a Prince of Solder was the, the name of the main prince from, from Dathomir. Um, and, uh, oh gosh, I've got to sit back and try to think of all the stuff I've created. Um, you know, there's, there's some parts in episode one where, um, I had turned in, in one of my little middle grade books I'd had, uh, I'd had this thing where my characters were going across uh, a large lake um, on, uh, uh, you know, flying across a large lake on a skimmer, and uh, and they have these giant fish that are leaping up and trying to eat them. And it was kind of funny because I was going, oh, wow, that really looks a lot like some of the things that happened in episode one. Um, you know, you just see little, little um, you know, I mean, you see little things all over the place uh, that you, you go, oh, yeah, that was just sort of a little throw idea. So it's kind of hard for me to know how much has been used um, elsewhere and how much is, you know, 
how much of it is is still out there waiting to be used, you know. But there's various character classes and uh, uh, you know inventions and stuff like that that we each put into our stories. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't know. Gosh, there's <laughs> just so much. It's hard to hard to get a handle on it all. I guess. Okay, so I guess one thing um, that <clears throat> comes to mind is in Clone Wars, in uh, you know Star Wars Cartoon on Cartoon Network, in season three they brought in the Witches of Dathomir and they brought in Dathomir. <clears throat> did you get to see the episodes with uh, the Witches of Dathomir and the Night Sisters and so on? Yeah. And if so, what did you think? I, you know, I haven't. I didn't get to see them. Um, I, I was a big fan and and loved the movies, but I haven't I haven't read a lot of the books. Um, you know, I I guess part of raising five kids and working for a living is that uh, that I have to forego a lot of those kinds of pleasures. Um, so I, I wish that I had. Um, I did get to see some of the video games where they had been brought in, um, and uh, and you know those the, I thought they did a pretty credible job with them. But I was looking at it more as okay, um, I'm a video game designer too. So uh, you know what what are they doing there? And and so I was more interested to sort of see what they were what they were creating. Okay. Well, you know, uh, if I may, um, not to extend the topic too far, but as far as, you know, the whole Witches of Dathomir and Dathomir go, um, when it comes to the whole concept behind the Witches of Dathomir, I would assume since you sort of, you know, brought that in, created that, so to speak, that you probably had a pretty good outline of, okay, this is who they are, this is what they believe in, you know, like to flesh it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, my, my question is this. And I know this is a silly question, but as role players are concerned, like myself and Jeremiah and others that listen, um, as far as the witches go, would you say that the witches are sort of a, like a completely separate sort of entity to any other sort of force-using sect, like Jedi or Sith or, vice, or so on and so forth? Well, the, the idea for the Witches of Dathomir, you know, quite frankly, came about because I was looking at the Star Wars universe and thinking there really aren't a lot of powerful female characters in that universe. OK, um, we had, uh, you know, if, if you were looking at Darth Vader and the Emperor and Luke Skywalker, it seemed, you know, it was really kind of, I don't know, male centric. <laughs> so. With the Witches of Dathomir, what I wanted to do was create um, basically the whole idea that if you have Force users, um, it seems to me that they're going to be the most powerful characters that you're going to have in your universe. I mean, if you add the Force to everything else. Um, and so they would have their own power structure, and it wouldn't matter whether they were male or female, human or alien. Um, with the Witches of Dathomir, what I created was um, really a, a strongly feminist society where the women were in control. And, uh, and that was really what I wanted to do, was to, to create some characters that we could use for other things that, that would create, um, you know, that would really give us a, a, a lot of potential, you know, strong female characters. Uh, the great thing about the Witches of Dathomir was that they were not, you know, either good or evil. There were both good and evil uh, Force users among them, so that you could choose what kind of, you know, Witch of Dathomir you could be. Um, and that was really what I wanted to do. I think that surely they're going to be different from the Sith. You know, the Sith have such a, a strong... Um, uh, kind of a, a background where, you know, there can only be, you know, there can only be one kind of a mentality. And uh, and I think that the Witches of Dathomir were designed to be a lot more pluralistic. You know, there can be a lot of different leaders and a lot of different powerful people and stuff among them. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say that certainly it's a different, um, a different society is really what it comes down to with like, the idea like that anybody can have power, but you can have a different societies arising from the same power. So, so in, it would almost kind of be like sort of a different ideology. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay, I, I was just curious, and as a fan, I had to ask. <laughs> but anyway, I think Jer over here has something he'd like to ask, so I'm going to throw it over to him. Sure. Okay, um, just to branch off a little bit from Star Wars, <clears throat> I remember when I was um, younger, 
I don't remember how old I was, when I was reading a certain series called uh, the Rune Lord series, mm-hmm. and uh, I got through, uh, I can't remember if it was book, I think it was book four, when the first the first set is done, basically, at book yeah. four. Mm-hmm. And I remember, you know, reading the back, I'm like, la, 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 and then I, I read it, and it said, you know, Dave Farland is Dave Wolverton, I'm like, and I, said, I did a double take looking at my Star Wars shelf. Mm-hmm. saying, Dave Wolverton, Dave, that seems familiar. And I look at my Star Wars shelf and see his Corsair Princess Leia there. I'm like, <gasps> and I remember having that aha moment of uh, freaking, not freaking out, but, you know, basically fre- figuring out that, oh, these p- books are read are written by the same person. So uh, one of the things, you know, that you do is I know you write your uh, sci-fi under uh, Dave Wolverton and you write your fantasy under Farland. Mm-hmm. So uh, what was the, the thinking behind that? Like, why did you decide to, to split? you know, your fantasy and sci-fi and use uh, two different names. Well, you know, I got a nice, really nice review one time years ago, um, back in about 91 or 92, that said, uh, yeah, you should go, you know, down to the bookstore and look on the bottom shelf where Dave Wolverton's books hang out, you know, uh, (laughs) and pick up this book. And I thought, you know, uh, putting your books on the bottom shelf is such a bad idea. Uh, Campbell's Soup had done a... uh, had done a survey and found that 92% of the people wouldn't stoop over and pick up their favorite brand of soup off the bottom shelf at the, at the store. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, I wonder if 92% of the people wouldn't stoop over and pick up their favorite author at the bottom uh, shelf at the store. So I really needed something. I really decided I needed a name that was going to put me up, you know, towards the middle of the racks a little bit better. And, um, and so when I switched and went and did my first big fantasy novel, I decided that that was time to go ahead and, you know, try something a little bit different. Um, just because I really wanted to have a, a better shelf space, you know. And so it made a lot of sense. Um, you know, I was with, with my science fiction books, um, I did really well, you know. I was a best selling science fiction author. Uh, New York Times bestseller, um, set the Guinness record for the world's largest book signing, uh, single author, single book signing, you know, with a, with a science, science fiction novel under Dave Wolverton. And, um, you know, so I was doing fine, but I really just felt like uh, it would be a good change overall. And, you know, I guess I'm kind of glad that I did uh, because I love fantasy, uh, but a lot of people, when you switch from writing science fiction to fantasy, you know, a lot of people feel like, okay, you're not really serious about your fantasy, you're slumming it or something like that. And the truth was I'd started out um, really being a a fan of both, you know. Um, I love science fiction, I love fantasy. Um, I don't particularly love one more than the other. Um, My two favorite novels of all time um, were Lord of the Rings and Dune. And so, uh, and I liked them pretty much equally well. Dune. Yes. Sorry, sorry, I apologize. I'm like, oh my God, somebody mentioned Dune. Yes. So, you know, I, I really loved doing both. And when I wrote my first novel, um, I wrote a science fiction novel, which uh, won the Philip K. Dick Award, uh, Memorial Special Award for, quote, best novel in the English language, which I just think is a hoot. Um, but anyway, you know, so I won this award. My my editor said, okay, so what are you going to do next? And um, I said, I want to do a big fantasy, sort of a Lord of the Rings kind of thing. And she said, well, Dave, you're a best-selling science fiction author. You know, the average author takes 20 years to get where you got with your first novel. You know, your sales are, are that good. And we really don't want a big fantasy from you. We, we want more science fiction from you. So, um, you know, I had to sort of kind of scale back and say, okay, I'm not going to do any fantasy. But you do something like Lord of the Rings, and it's kind of a science fantasy mix, you know. There there are certain fantastic elements to it, and then there's the science fiction elements to it. And uh, and so it's um, you know, it's a fun, fun thing to work with. Okay, and we know one of your... Uh... <clears throat> You know, you've done with fantasy your biggest series versus Rune Lords, and with you've done lots of science fiction. But one of the things that not everyone knows is, uh, you know, you had a uh, a decent sized role in designing stuff for uh, for Starcraft Brood War. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. For many, is uh, you know one of the biggest or best sci fi games of all time. It's usually one of the, considered one of the best you know computer games ever created. Uh-huh. So. Uh, why don't you t- you tell the the listeners as you know James didn't even know. Uh, yeah, I didn't even know that. I want to know that. 
your influence on I know the designs and stories and so on for Starcraft Brood War and uh, you know how that came to be sure. and so on and working with with Blizzard. Well, what what happened was um, you know I uh, I had written Rune Lords and uh, hadn't gotten it published yet. And so I was thinking that there were some strong video game possibilities to come out of the Rune Lord. And um, I read an article about a local uh, uh, video game company that was up in uh, the Provo Orem area. It's called Sapphire. And um, so I went down to Sapphire and uh, spoke with them and said, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in making a video game. And they said, well, you kind of need some video game credits, you know. They said, are you any good at writing proposals? And I said, actually, I'm really good at writing proposals. And they say, great. Uh, we've got this game called StarCraft. We'd like to, you know, kind of do an expansion pack for it. And, uh, you know, uh, we've got an outline of what we'd like to do. And they said, if you, uh, if you write a proposal and you can get uh, a contract with a uh, and to do the StarCraft Brood War, uh, we'll put you on as the uh, co-leader of the design team. And I said, okay. So I went and uh, took what they had and kind of massaged it a little bit and wrote up a proposal. And we sent it off to, um, sent it off to Blizzard. And um, I remember, you know, we faxed it off. And I went down to get some milk and, um, uh, and then go home. Milk uh, does the body good. Yes, and, and I, I got the milk and I got home and it was like, couldn't have been 45 minutes later and I got a call that said, hey, StarCraft said they really like this proposal and uh, or the folks at Blizzard really like this proposal and, and uh, so, you know, come in tomorrow, you're going to be co-leader on the design team for the Brood War. Um, so, um, you know, it was really just kind of an easy thing. Basically, they said, okay, give us some ideas and let's decide what we're going to do. And so, for example, the Zerg Lurkers um, in Rune Lords, I had, my, um, I had my Reaver creatures. And I says the way they hunt is that they hide under the ground. And then when you come near, they swarm up and try to grab you. And I said, could we do that in the video game? And we came up with the Zerg Lurkers. And, and then they were like, okay, so... You know, we got a problem the humans die too easily. You know, let's give them better armor, better weapons. And I said, why don't you give them better medics, you know, so that we save the ones who are going to die. And they're like, oh, that's really cool because that hadn't been done before in a video game. So it was really a matter of me just uh, sitting down and coming up with ideas for various weapons and, you know, um, different types of, uh, you know, different types of vehicles and stuff like that. And um, yeah, it was just a fun. It was a fun game. I just did a, spent a couple of days on it. Worked with a, an artist, and we came up with some uh, concept designs. And then we'd send them off to um, send them off to the to Blizzard and uh, get their approval on which ones they liked. And uh, it all just worked out really well. You know, at the time that we did it um, with Brood War, we were told that they were going to come out with StarCraft II the following year. So this expansion pack was just going to be a little thing, but we did such a good job with the expansion pack that um, you know it started winning awards and became an international bestseller. And they didn't make StarCraft II for another 15 years, you know, uh, which really surprised me. Um, it just kept on going. And even today, I was watching. Um, gosh, just a few few months ago, I was watching uh, the World Championship video game. Uh, tournament going on in Korea, and uh, in the final round, they were playing StarCraft Brood War. So I'm sitting here. You know, this has been it's been almost 15 years since I started working on that. Since I worked on that game, and to still have it, you know, out there and selling and being played for international tournaments, you know, 15 years later, that's just that's just amazing to me. That's mind boggling. <laughs> Before before James starts, with his, he has a comment shortly. Um, I have one thing to ask though. In in Brood War, there is a, at the very end, there's like a bonus level, which well, they call it a bonus level, but I know everyone who's ever played it gets that level. I have. So I'm not sure. I know what you're talking. I'm not sure about. how how it's a hidden level, but um, there's a level that involves um, I want to say Lieutenant Duran who yes. goes off, who, who escapes and so on, and starts working on like these uh, hybrids between uh, 
Protoss and Zerg and, and so on, which really hints at what was, you know, what's to come in StarCraft II. Uh-huh. And so I was just wondering, is, is that something that you came up with or something that Blizzard came up with? Because out of everything in that entire game, that is the one level that really says there's going to be more and this is what's going to happen. Yeah, that's right? the one that, that's the one, if I may say so, that's the part that made me go, like, because I, I, I'll tell you, I just played through Brood War, like, maybe a month ago. Like, I play it, like, religiously. I love the original StarCraft, the expansion. Uh-huh. It's awesome. And even I'm like, you know, they did this back then. They had to have set it up. This had to be a setup. So I'm, I'm curious to then answer myself. You know, that wasn't something that uh, was in our original plan. And um, I... I, I don't know for sure if that came from I, I suspect that that came from Starcraft uh, or from from Blizzard because um, I don't remember my um, you know it certainly wasn't the original plan that we put together and uh, one of the things that you have to realize is that Sapphire was sort of a subcontractor okay and so when we when we made the game we were making it under the direction of Blizzard and I think Blizzard must have been thinking yeah this will be cool to to uh, set it up for the next game and, and do it that way. Ah, okay, all right. But yeah. you know what? I, I do have to say one thing. You, you're the one that made my life a living hell in that game with those Reavers. <laughs> Ugh, I hated yeah. those things, man. And you know yeah. what? The fact that I got so emotional over them, I, I, literally, I, I hope you can hear me applauding. Yeah, because yeah. very few things in video games ever actually really tick me off that bad. <laughs> you, you, sir, are awesome for that because those reavers always, always tick me off. Oh, I, I loved it when we put those in the game, and, and you'd watch the players, and and I would go through and watch the, uh, uh, you know, because because we have people who are playing the game, you know, as game testers, and I would I would just sit there and be watching them, and they'd be playing along, and they'd be so happy, like I'm winning, I'm winning. And then the Zerg lurkers would come up, and you would just watch their jaws drop and their faces pale. And uh, yeah, it was uh, it turned their lives into a living hell. <laughs> Love to do that some more. <laughs> Love to do that some more. Yeah. Okay. So uh, a couple um, questions to do with, with video games. Like, what other games have you uh, been able to work on? Then, because you said you you know you've worked on on video games. I'm assuming it's not just StarCraft. Well, I I worked on a few. You know. Um, I worked on a few when I was working with uh, uh, working there back in Provo, and and I just did it for a couple of years. And um, uh, most of the kinds of things that we did, we did some little fight games and a couple. We did what we did a really nice game called Barbarians. It was a, a fight game with barbarians and magic and stuff like that that uh, we did for a big French video game company, whose president promptly, I think. Um, uh, ran off with all the funds for the company, and so the game was never published. Um, you know, and that's kind of the thing about video games. It's sort of like making movies. You can go out and make a movie and, and never get it released, and so you've got this movie, which may be a very good movie, just kind of sitting in the vaults. Um, right now I'm working on a game um, for a, a, a little company back in Germany, and uh, and I should you know they're not really little they they do uh, MMOs and um, can you tell us who it's called it's called Infernum is the name of the, the company and we're getting ready to put out a game called Theralon T H E R A L O N and so you can kind of look it up and uh, we're getting a little video ready um, they're going to be doing a Kickstarter project to to get this company going but we've been working on it for about a year uh, a little bit over a year. And uh, I created uh, created a world, character classes, races, you know, all that kind of stuff. Because I, I used to be a big D and D geek and and whatnot when I was younger, and um, and so I've always wanted to do a big fantasy MMO. And this one's really cinematic. It's almost like watching a Star Wars movie or something as you're playing it. That's that's what our goal is to is to get that sense of adventure into a big MMO. And uh, and so we're having kind of we're having a lot of fun with that. But that's going to be my next my next um, my next big game, I guess. Is, is so it. is an MMO. Yes. <laughs> ah, yes, it is an MMO. You just said the magic word. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, I love MMOs. Yeah. Oh, I, I can't help it. I'm huge on MMOs. I, I've played 
a bunch of them. You know, the obvious World of Warcraft, uh, City of Heroes, DC Online, Eve Online. I, you name it, I've at least tried it. So yeah. I'm looking forward to this fantasy MMO. I, I wonder yeah. though, it's it's not going to be anything near along the lines of like WoW or anything like that. Like, is it going to be something we might know about or we might be able to identify with, or is it going to be something completely new? You know, um, first of all, on whether or not it's going to be anything like WoW, uh, you know, these guys are saying, oh, yes, we're not trying to beat WoW. We're, we're just going to do our own thing. But I think they all want to beat WoW. Uh, <laughs> I think I think it can be really cool. Um, we're putting a lot of work into it. And uh, and I think that, you know, I, I think it could go big. You know, I just really do. Um, I think it makes a lot more sense. We've created a really cool history. Uh, we've created some really great ideas for um, several different series of novels, movies, uh, TV series uh, that could extend uh, throughout the history of, of this uh, universe that we've created. And um, I, I, just have a, I just have a sense that this could go big. You know, you, when you write a, a novel or when you create a video game or you, you know, work on a movie or something, you just really never quite know what's going to happen with it. <laughs> you know, you get <laughs> sense. You get, I mean, with, with Starcraft, you know, it was sort of like, okay, it was the first video game I worked on. It was, you know, um, going to be a little thing that was going to be out for a year and then was going to be forgotten. You know, that's, that's what I thought was going to happen. I didn't expect it to go as big as it did. Never uh, underestimate South Koreans, my friend. Yes. But then, you know, I start looking at this, uh, I start looking at this video game and I'm like, you know what? I, I fully anticipate that it could be as big as World of Warcraft or bigger, you know, because I think that artistically and the storyline and, and we, you know, it just makes a lot more sense than World of Warcraft, you know, which is a, a fun game. You know, don't get me wrong, but but it's been out for a long time. It's getting a bit dated, and um, I just a think bit? It's, <laughs> it's okay. This is Bombad Radio. You can be you can be yeah. as forthcoming as you want because as a gamer and as a writer of a gamer on your end, you, 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 a bit. Come on now. Yeah, okay. It's okay. it's it's, it's yeah. outdated. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to offend World of Warcraft. Players. Oh no, it's a great <laughs> game. It's a great game, but it's. I think it's run its course. Yeah, and, and I think it has too, and um, and I think that we can do better, and uh, and I think that, you know, the gods be willing, and uh, and the uh, my my game designing friends and everything, uh, you know, if everything works together, then yeah, this could be this could be huge, you know, and I think it could be a, a big series for television or for movies, you know, um, the way that we've got it set up. Uh, it's really quite cool. Um, saying that and being under NDA at the same time is kind of difficult, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, we got, mm. I got a nice storyline, and and uh, and I think the art director we've got is great, and uh, the team that we put together of gamers, uh, they've they've you know they've produced some. I don't even know how many games they've done between them all, you know. But uh, um, we've we've got a whole bunch of really talented people working on this and and i just expect it to to do well oh absolutely but and and you were saying of course that there's going to be a kickstarter for this yes yeah yeah in fact i'm going to germany um on october 4th uh and i'm going to be up there for a few days to just kind of help them um get the kickstarter project going so we're going to be doing we're going to be putting out some little tapes and stuff like that but i know they've got some little announcements online right now with a, a little demos and and stuff like that so you can you can uh, look up theralon um on youtube and uh find out about the theralon video game there and see a little bit of the demo uh demo reels that they're putting together Oh no, absolutely! Because we we love you know we we love Kickstarter. We 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 endorse the heck out of it. So yeah, if you got a Kickstarter coming out for this, believe me, we'll promote the heck out of it till the cows come home. Yeah, yeah. You know, absolutely. So you yeah. just give us information. I guarantee you, we'll spread it as far as we can get it. Right, yeah. Jer? Right. 
<laughs> anyway, yeah, you know, Kickstarter is really turning into a viable way for video game companies to, to do something like this because we can get uh, people, you know, or on early to start playing the game and uh, enjoying it and telling their friends about it and and they love to be involved with it and to help um, you know help help uh, pay the bills to get the thing made. I mean that's that's really Kickstarter is just just a wonderful way for people involved in the industry to to um, you know, start a project like this. So and and they're not going to need a whole lot of money to to get this going because we did come in with initial funding and get an awful lot of work done over the last year and, and uh, really kind of set this up big. Okay, so um, that's uh, – it's a, I actually saw the website. It's www.theraland.com, mm -hmm. and it talks about that, that this MMORPG. But for the last section, we're going to move on to a, a little bit different topic because uh, one of the things that you're also well known for is for helping and inspiring um, new writers – Mm -hmm. And you also have a history of at least being a, a teacher for quite a few um, big writers nowadays. Uh huh. Yeah. Because you were a, a professor at, at BYU. Uh, I believe you taught sci-fi, but yep. that might have just been my professor Laura Card just telling me things. But um, but it, it, I know in your class, uh, at least according to to what I've heard, there you go, name drop. No, yet you've had in your in your class you've had authors like uh, Brandon Sanderson, of course, who writes Wheel of Time now, as well as other series. We've had Brandon Mole, I believe Stephanie Meyer was in your class, uh -huh. Dan Wells, authors like that. So, uh, what's it like, you know, seeing these students that were in your class, wow, going off on their own, just writing their own worlds, writing their own series, and becoming really famous? Dude, I love this show. I didn't even know that you yeah. taught Stephanie Meyer. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, yeah, Stephanie came to my class in uh, 2002 at BYU, I think it was, uh, uh, which would have been spring term. And, um, you know, she was really a very nice young lady, very intelligent, very passionate about her writing, um, you know, very, uh, very excited. She'd never taken a writing class, uh, and I don't think she ever took another writing class besides mine. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's really kind of what sets writers apart, you know, when Brandon Sanderson came into my class um, with Dan Wells and, uh, you know, my wife, I got home and she says, so did you discover any great new writers today? And I says, yeah, a couple. And she says, how do you know? You haven't even seen anything they've written. And I says, because they ask the right questions, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, and so a lot of it has to do with the passion and the intelligence and the native gifts that the authors, you know, come to me with. And of course, I, I also work with the Writers of the Future program. Um, I'm the coordinating judge for the for the contest uh, now. I, I did it for about nine years and then just took up the reins again a couple of months ago. Um, and so that puts me in touch with a lot of writers who, um, you know, who potentially are going to rise up as stars. So, you know, I've got people like Eric Flint and uh, who's, you know, really big in his, um, you know, his alternate history uh, works and, uh, you know, people like, um, oh, I don't know, just uh, – I don't even like to name all their names. But put it this way, I've taught a lot of people who've gone on to win major awards and, and become international bestsellers, I'll put it that way. Uh, but, but the... Uh, <laughs> yes. Sorry, I had to laugh. <laughs> well, the, thing is, the thing is, a lot of the authors who are big award winners, they like to, you know, downplay the fact that they've ever had any teachers or anything. And so, you know, I don't even, you know, some of them I just, out of respect, I don't even mention who they are. Um, but but I also, you know, teach individual writing workshops. And so some of the people like, um, you know, Brandon Mull came out of just one of the writing workshops that I taught up in the Salt Lake area um, on my own. So it wasn't really with the school um, uh, involved there. But, um, but certainly, um, you know, that kind of helped to get him launched and uh, sent him in the right direction. And, you know, we, you know, my goal is to just uh, help writers fulfill their dreams, you know, uh, becoming the best they can be. And, um, and of course, whenever that happens, uh, what happens is people get excited about their writing and they get excited about reading and about books. And I just see it as sort of a win-win because uh, then people go out and buy more books years ago. Back in 1989, there was a, a year where hardcover book sales just went up 
uh, by like thirty percent, and all the publishing industry was trying to figure out why. Uh, all of a sudden, there was this huge rise in book sales. So I looked at it and I said, "There's a lot of good books came out last year, you know." And I kept going out and buying hardcover books that I was like, oh, "I don't really want to spend this much, but this is such a good book, I'm going to go ahead and buy it." And, um, and that's the way that this whole industry works. Happens with movies too. If a couple of great movies come out, you know, one year, um, entire industry rises uh, as a result of, of you know, just a good. So Good thing coming out. So, um, so I love seeing I love seeing my my authors, you know, go out and make money. And you know, I do a little thing called the daily kick. I send out an advice column to um, anybody who wants to get on. All they do is they go to www.davidfarland.com and you sign up. And I send out these letters. And I used to do them daily. Now I'm only doing them a couple or three times a week. But um, but you know, even just off of that, I've had authors who've written me and said, Dave, I want to thank you for all your advice. I've been, you know, reading your daily kicks for the last year and a half, and I just wrote a novel and sold it for $400,000. And, you know, uh, and so, you know, I don't even know how many authors I've, I've kind of touched that way. I so, would so you rather enjoy, wait, Jared, should you rather enjoy kicking new authors in the pants? Yeah, but Jared, yes, I'm I, telling you, I'm signing up for this. I, I do. I love to kick new authors in the pants. Uh, I actually had an author who said one day, you know, what I really need, Dave, is for you to come over to my house and kick me in the pants every day and get me started on my writing. And uh, and I thought, oh, yeah, I'm sure. And then I got to thinking about it on the on a drive home, and I thought, you know, I could actually do that. I could write a little article every day that would be uh, an inspirational or instructional article to uh, to get you writing. And I've had so many people who – were writing me asking for advice, I thought, and I'd probably save time because I'd only be writing one little article a day instead of answering 15 or 20 emails every day. So it was actually kind of a little thing to just save myself a little bit of time um, and, uh, you know, a little service. And I guess I've been doing it for about five years now. Uh, yeah. Well, if I, if I may, since, since we have, we've graced with your presence, <laughs> but since you are here, you know, uh, as you know, you know, we come from a role playing community. That's you know, kind of what we do is writing. So I, I, I would like to ask one question. You know, on behalf of the uh, shall we say old school Star Wars role playing writers, but for those of us that that have been writing characters for so long and we've done so much as far as you know, writing you know the character, the background, where they come from, what they've done. Mm-hmm. For those of us that find that we're in a bit of a rut. Or maybe we, we feel that, you know, that, you know, what more can I do? Do you have any sort of advice on how to reinvigorate a character in, in a way that makes that character seem fresh and new? Yeah, yeah. My, my basic advice is this. You know, characters don't exist in isolation. And, and the biggest problem when you, uh, when you create a character who feels like he's kind of you know, old and in a rut, is that what you need is you need um, another character, somebody that uh, they bounce off of. So, for example, if I had a, a heroic character that I created for a game like this, um, I would look now at saying, okay, now I need to create a really great villain, okay, that uh, is going to oppose this character. And maybe once I got that done, I'd say, okay, now I need a kind of a maybe a guide character, a, a, a wizard, or someone to be a teacher to my uh, protagonist. And maybe I need a love interest, and maybe I need some sidekicks, and maybe my villain needs, um, you know, needs his own, um, you know, master at arms, and maybe he needs some henchmen and, you know, minions and this kind of thing. And so really what, what I have to do is to say, okay, quit looking at this character too much in isolation. Let's start looking at him as part of a larger community that uh, really creates a story. And once I do that, then I get a really vigorous story that, you know, uh, just kind of takes off by itself. So I guess a follow-up on that one is, um, you know, how you talk about reinvigorating characters. So, like, one more on actual writing before we go into the final little part. So when, you, when you're writing and you reach, say, uh, you know, you're partway through a book and you reach... Uh, you know, writer's block or, you know, a block that you just, you can't seem to get by. Like, what are some of the, the tactics or methods that you use to be able to punch through 
writer's block or you know force your way through through writing hell so to speak when you when you can't figure out what to do that would actually work but at the same time if you just stop you know nothing will get done amen yeah. I, I i'd love to hear the answer to this one too because i hit this block constantly okay well first of all writer's block almost always comes when you don't know what's going to happen next in the story you know you feel like you have a general sense of the direction but nothing excites you and so um so a lot of times it's a matter of sitting down and saying, okay, let me look at this from the villain's point of view. What's he going to do next? Okay. Or what does the sidekick come up with as an idea that maybe I haven't considered? And so the, the first thing I do is I look at it from the points of view of all the other characters. You know, they're, they're sort of like billiard balls bouncing off of each other at a certain point in the story. And I look at that and then I look at what has to happen next. And sometimes, you know, as an author, you just you just want to stretch so far and and uh, and try to reach the next level that um, you set maybe you set standards that are so high for yourself that maybe nobody can meet them, um, or, or you're just you know you're you're working at your limits. So I try to sit back and say, okay, what are my strengths? What do what do I do really well? And uh, maybe maybe I should uh, dial back here a little bit and say, okay. I know how to tell this kind of story. I'm heading in this direction. Let's go ahead and, and you know try that. Um, so, but the major thing I think is that this is for me. Okay, I get in the middle of the book, and I look at my story and I go, okay, what happens next? And I always have to look at ways to either um, deepen or broaden the conflict. And by that I mean broaden the conflict is bring more people in, make the conflict bigger. Uh, and uh, and deepening it means that you make it more personal to your characters. And so if I can figure out that next step for the next, you know, two or three steps, then the middle of my story gets going. Because, uh, you know, quite frankly, my beginnings and endings, um, they tend to take care of themselves pretty well. But those middle parts is, is where most of us end up, I think, uh, fighting, you know, finding difficulty in the middle of our stories. Anyway, so um, so really, it's a matter of sitting back and just reevaluating, and uh, and enjoying it. You know, that's one of the big things with writing is that you have to just enjoy it as a process. If you don't enjoy it, it just becomes work. And so you look for the ways to make it fun too. Ah, so would you know as a role player, I I do have to first off thank you for your advice because. I've been writing this one character as far as role play goes for oh I don't know how long has it been now Jer fifteen years uh thirteen Thir to be Phantom Menace Thir thirteen yep. four about fourteen years because it was before Phantom Menace came out I remember that uh -huh. um, but yeah I I've been writing this one character you know Cat hence where my little nickname for the show comes from uh -huh. I've been writing him for a really long time and he he's actually uh, identified as a Sith. Mm -hmm. And he's uh, kind of a psychotic, drug-addled, crazy, part of my French, but bastard. Um, that's what he does. And I'm wondering, when somebody writes someone that long, when you get to that point where you feel that, you know, I've done so much, I, I've done all this with this character, do, do you feel that maybe there are times where characters should be retired? Oh, gosh. You know, um... <laughs> I, I used to do quite a bit of role-playing game, and I know what you mean, because you invest so much in that character, and, and after that long, they, they sort of take over and, uh, and come alive. Um, and yet, I find even today, when I'm writing, uh, when I'm writing novels, you know, the skills that you learned in role-playing are just invaluable. I, I don't know whether I would re retire them, I would simply say, okay, let's more, you know, make more characters. Um, but you know, I don't think you can really ever retire somebody truly that you've uh, you've invested so much time and energy and you know mental and uh, emotional uh, energy into. So I I'd, I'd go ahead and keep him, you know, um, but recognize that he needs to have his own place within a story and uh, and then just go from there. Well, that's it, folks. You've heard it here first. Ket will terrorize you once again. Be That's prepared. Right. 
<laughs> and, well, I, I do appreciate that, you know, because I, I, I've been wondering that, and I, I can't help but sometimes feel a little like, you know, what more can I really do? But I, I guess, in a sense, you're right. There's always something else. There's always something new. There's always another direction you could take it. Always more people that you could bring into it. I, I guess it really only is limited by your imagination. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that the biggest failure in novels, you know, in novelists, uh, potential novelists, is the failure of imagination. And, you know, sometimes they fail to create characters. Sometimes they fail to create their world properly. Sometimes they fail to think of cool new conflicts that, you know, uh, that present themselves or look for opportunities. And, you know, so it's really a matter of, wow, just keep keep working your imagination, keep mining it, and uh, and you'll do okay. Okay, so to begin wrapping this up, because I have class soon, and we've had you for an hour, so we said an hour, so we're going to begin wrapping this up. So I know um, recently, like in you're working on uh, Nightingales. You're working on the Nightingale series. Mm -hmm. You just released uh, a tale of. Uh, is a tale of tales. Is the last Rain Lords one? Yeah, I'm. I'm getting ready to release that. Um, I'm. I'm actually still finishing that book off, and uh, uh -huh. and so that's going to come out probably next year. Um, okay. I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm not quite done with it yet, but will be soon. Uh, Nightingale is uh, is out. It's a new series um, set here in Utah about a young man who uh, was abandoned at birth and raised in foster care, and uh, he's kind of kicked from home to home because um, people think he's a bit too strange. And he comes here to Southern Utah where he uh, goes to school and he meets a teacher who recognizes that he's not even human. He's what she calls a nightingale and. Uh, that's about him discovering who he is, where he came from, and uh, discovering what his powers are. He's a separate species from humans. And um, anyway, so it's a it's a new tale. It just won the uh, uh, won an international book award for best young adult novel of the year, and it just won the uh, uh, Hollywood uh, festival for best book of the year, uh, which is kind of cool because I beat all small categories with that one. So. Um, so it's it's a really fun tale, and uh, it's more along the line. It's a young adult fantasy thriller, so I would say it's kind of, yeah, I don't know. I keep trying to figure out what it's like, and it, nothing really comes to mind. <laughs> I had one I had one reviewer who said uh, it was like high school musical, uh, falls in love with Twilight, and has Harry Potter babies. And I thought, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. That, that, explain, that explains it as well as anything I can come up with. You know what I was going to say? I was going to say, have you been stalking Jeremiah? Because I don't think that he's human. And if yeah. he's really not human, then he is the protagonist of your book. That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I, for me, when I was a kid, you know, I used to look at other people and I just felt so different. I used to say, you know, those humans are so funny. And I, I said it to one of my classmates when I was like 13, and he's like, Dave, you're human. And I'm like, ah, you know, yeah, sort of, just a little bit. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the last things we like to do uh, with all of our guests is we like to give them the soapbox. Um, this, you know, gives an opportunity to promote anything they want to promote, any current projects, any current um, – Charity, some of want to promote any causes. So uh, we're going to give you the soapbox. The box. Any, soap box. Any, anything you'd like to promote, anything you'd like to, to talk up, even if it's yourself. Yes, absolutely. Um, you have the floor, and you can... Uh, and keep in mind, the soapbox, you can promote something, you could make a fart noise. We don't <laughs> care. It's totally... The, here's the stage. We put you in the middle of the stage. Here's a microphone. Talk. Okay. Well, you know what? I've, I've got something that um, is just this week is coming out. It's called uh, – it's the Enhanced Novel for Nightingale. And an enhanced novel is different from a regular novel in that um, we've got a musical soundtrack uh, done by James Guymond, who is the uh, uh, vice president of the American Composers Guild. He did this really great soundtrack for it. Um, 45 minutes. Uh, then there's a uh, um, 
illustrations with each chapter in full color, multiple illustrations with animations, and there are interviews with me uh, tucked in here and there, and little uh, you know kind of special nuggets where I talk about the book, and it's uh, available on the Apple iPad if you've got iPad users. And the cool thing about this is Are we that, talking iTunes if I may interrupt? Yes. Uh-huh. And ah, so available on iTunes. Okay. And you can get it. It's nine ninety nine, which is, you know, less than half the price of the hardcover, and yet gives you so much more. And the people who've been reading it, you know, the reviews that I've been getting from people are saying, you know, after after reading this, because it involves you visually and with the music and you know, and the story you know, they say it's it's so much better than reading a normal novel, you know, that it's it's like you have to experience this because it's halfway movie, halfway novel. Um, and it, it's something that I've really, uh, you know, thought about for a long time. I was hired by IBM back in 1989 to, uh, to look at taking books and computerizing them putting them with illustrations and sound and stuff like that. And, uh, and I realized at the time that what I wanted to do was so far ahead of where we were, um, you know, technologically what we could do that, you know, it was going to be 10 or 15 years. Well, here it's been more than 20 years and, uh, and they're finally getting there. But, you know, I have a vision for, for novels that um, really goes well beyond even what we're able to do right now. But you know, having said that, um, you know, I'm, taking new technology and basically enhancing the story, um, you know, putting it with pictures and music and, and uh, you know, involving you intellectually in ways that, um, that a, a book just can't do. So, you know, for 500 years, we've all been reading books, you know, um, ever since the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg, you know, we're, we've been doing it the same way. And uh, this is the next leap forward. So, um, so my soapbox for the week. <laughs> and any week you want to come and have the soapbox, you're more than welcome. We tell okay, well, every thanks. guest we've had, every guest we've had, if you want to come back on the show and talk, if you just want a five-minute segment, you want to soapbox something, you let us know, you're more than welcome. We don't care. You come back as many times as you want. You want to come every week? Fine by us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is this is really great. I've got a lot of ex exciting things going on, you know, between uh, the Enhanced Novel and Theralon and the final Rune Lords books. And uh, we're looking at making a Rune Lords movie. I've uh, got the screenplay done for it. Now talking to investors and uh, talking to a director and, you know, a lot of, lot of fun things coming up. So um, I'll give you one thing just to focus on that because I don't want to don't want to spread myself too thin. But uh, oh. I'd love to come back and talk to you. Oh, anytime. Honest to God, anytime. Please keep us in the loop. Anything you've got going on, we'd be more than happy to talk about. I guarantee you, at least one of us, if not both of us, which would probably be all the time, would be interested in it. Anything you got going on, you come talk to us. We'll spread it as far as we can get it. And granted, we might be a bit minor league at the moment, only at the moment. But we have been getting there and we have been reaching out farther. So we really don't mind because, honestly, when it comes to good works uh, of writing, as far as hardcover books, short stories, video games, movies, it doesn't matter. If somebody that's really good at their craft wants a platform in which to speak, in which to try to let a more broader audience know about what they're doing, if we can provide that, we're all for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you're doing 